Um, we can start with that, the sources because the text I wanted to talk about is the uh, probably the most well known pasuk in, in Tanakh. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeinu Hashem Echad. Right? Um, anyone want to translate that for me? Here, O oh Israel, uh, the Lord is our God and the Lord is one. Yeah. Um, that um, is excellent. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Um, it's slightly like different from what you often hear it, which is the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, right? Um, that Elkeinu is, is just an assumed sort of adjective being stuck on there, Hashem Elkeinu, Hashem Echad. Uh, that it, it's, it's saying, we're t- here in Israel, we're talking about Hashem our God, this is what we have to say about him, which is that Hashem is one. Um, and that is uh, really a common interpretation. That's um, it's all like the idea that the, what Shema is, is then it's like the, the declaration of monotheism. That is, the point is to say there is one God, right? That's the, the point of Kriya Shema. Uh, they, like, tell her about her. What? Uh, or, or of panentheism, whatever you want to call it. Um, so even Ryan would admit that like, not every Jew has ever been a uh, uh, panentheist. They didn't always understand. Um, but I'm going to go at the sources. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Okay. No, great. Forward, uh, so I forward the, them to the Orita chat? Um, if you want. Uh, we'll, we'll just, I got hard copies here for everyone who wants hard copies. Um, uh, so the, what's it called? That is the, the typical interpretation. Um, and it's, sorry, there's eight pages of sources here, my apologies. Um, no one needs eight pages, but um, the, that is, that's, that's absolutely the normal understanding of this classic. But um, that's not how, um, how I think it has to be understood, or even necessarily should. Um, but before I get into that, let's look at the, perhaps the best expositor of the, you know, that's how you understand the Shema, which is, the Rambam, right? So Rambam, um, in uh, the uh, beginning of Sefer Hamitzvot, but also you know the beginning of um, the beginning of Hilchot uh, Yisodei Torah, uh, talks about the pasuk of Kriyat Shema. So if you look at source number two here. This is from the, the, the second mitzvah according to Rambam. A mitzvah hashniya he had zivoy she zivano beemet and beemunat yichud is the command to uh, believe in the uh, in the the oneness. Who should not amin ki poel hamitziyut v'sivat so arishana achad who who amroyit ale imroyit ale yishimai shalosh mokenu achad. Right. So the the second mitzvah is to grant to acquire knowledge of the nature of God's unity to understand that the original Creator and source of all existence is one. The source of this commandment is God's statement, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Right, so for Rambam, the, the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema is to be a philosopher, to be the, or a theologian, someone who knows about God, right, who knows the truth about God's oneness. Uh, but as I said, not the only way to understand that pasuk. I'm going to look here at, uh, for, look at Ibn Ezra. Uh, it's the next one. Ikar hu the, the, the essential part of the pasuk is not echad. If you think about it for Rambam, the whole weight of the Pasuk Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeinu Hashem Echad rests in that last word, Echad. Like, that's what really matters. Um, but for, for Ibn Ezra, the Ikar is Eloheinu. V'nichpal k'mo k'en Echad v'etam levado. And it says this, this idea that God is our God, that, that is in fact the essence of the verse, is actually repeated in uh, the word Echad. Because Ibn Ezra does not think the word Echad means one in this Pasuk. He does, does not mean the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It means the Lord our God, the Lord, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Hashem alone is our God. Right? And that, in fact, is the, the Pasuk. Do you think there's a possibility that um, from uh, Hilchot, De- no, it's not Hilchot, De- this one before, where it's like um, you cannot imagine other gods. Oh, you saw the Torah. You saw the Torah, thank you. So his second mitzvah is you cannot understand, like, you can't imagine that there are any other gods. So therefore, it's essential for him to believe there's only one God, as opposed to Ibn Ezra that is not so stressed about them and not imagining there are no other gods. Um, something like that. Um, for Rambam, I'm very concerned with the question of if there are other gods or not, or the nature of God's unity. And for Ibn Ezra, the puzzle isn't as much about that. What it's about, I think we'll see, uh, it emerges a little even more clearly from uh, the Rashabam, the Rishimun ben Meir, uh, Rashi's grandson, the, um, his, his commentary on the Pasuk. We'll just look at the the uh, second line of that, right, the second sort of bold in the Rashbam is Hashem Echad, Lo Levado Na'avod, and He alone we shall serve. 
We won't worship any other God alongside God. A few will some because they do any other sort of divination. Kamoshi Prasyam, as he explained before. So the, the in weight of the Pasuk of Kriya Shema falls not on the question of do we know that God is one and do we have some sort of intellectual understanding of God. This is the question of our dedication and our worship. The question of who do we serve is, is what is at issue. Right? That for Rambam, fundamentally... Judaism is about truth, um, and for um, so it's just that's what it's about. And um, we are not going to go through <laughs> sources, you know, seven through um, ten on here. But I've grabbed some sources in the Rambam. Rambam has a a whole theory of human nature and of the purpose of the Torah that is about trying to take us from our misunderstandings of the world and the misunderstandings of God toward the truth about reality. Yeah. Do you think that? There's like any place for that anymore, or do you kind of just say like, yeah, that's just outdated. Um, I think there's a degree of confidence Rambam has that in the capacity to understand truth, in the capital T sense, that is outdated. Um, I think that not caring about truth at all is very dangerous, yeah. right? That um, if you uh, f- like think all that matters is what I feel about things, then there can be, that can take you to all kinds of problems. Um, but I think one thing that definitely happens once you say, well, capital T truth is not uh, like available necessarily, or at least not in some strict sense, um, is you might change the, the emphasis. So for Rambam, like, it makes sense to emphasize that truth is what everything is about, because uh, one, he thinks it's accessible, and two, he thinks that like, that's, the, in general, the purpose of human life is to discover truth. But if you think that like, we'll never get to truth with the capital T, we can sort of always be on the road to trying to figure out but never actually get there, then you might think there's actually some other thing we're trying to do or might be valuable to be doing. Yeah. Right? And so that, again, raises the question of like, Kriya Shema. Kriya Shema is not, for, like, is, is for good reason, the uh, most common, like most known Pasuk in the Torah. Right? Because it is a defining aspect of Judaism. It's it, it, not just in like, a broader theoretical sense, but also in like, a daily sense. Right? You have to say Kriya Shema twice a day, because I'll codify that. Um, and um, what's all, the, um, they codified it as a part of like, the rhythms of Jewish life to define ourselves based on Pazak. So it matters a lot if you think that, like Rambam, the thing you have to do every day, night and day, is say, I know the truth about God and reality, or you just say, I have dedicated my life to serving Hashem. Like, that's what it's about. Um, I think, in some sense, the language of Chazal is very telling about this. Um, so I have here from, from Gwara Brachot. Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha. Lama kadma parshat shema v'ohavahaya im shemoa, k'deh sh'yikabel olav omachut shemaim t'chila. Why did the parsha of Shema come before Bahayim Shema, right? When we say them in, uh, in Shema every day, why do we say the, the Pasuk of Shema and the following paragraph before we say the paragraph of Bahayim Shema? If they come from different parts in Devarim, why did Chazal put them in that order? That the first thing you do, you do what you say Shema, is accept the yoke of the kingdom, kingship of heaven, or the yoke, um, and afterwards the mitzvot. Right? So for Chazal, Kriyat Shema is not fundamentally about, like, philosophy, right? At least it's not how I would understand the, the phrase, Kavat uh, Oma Chut Shemayim, right? Accepting the yoke of heaven is not the same as saying, I want to, be a, uh, I want to know the truth about reality. What it is, is he's saying a statement of, as we saw in, in the Ibn Ezra, the Hikar Hu Eloheinu, that God is our God. That when I say Shema, I'm not, in a sense, reporting a fact about reality. I'm not... Um, making a, a claim about something outside myself, what I, I am actually saying is something very, making a very personal statement. Making a statement about my own deep engagement with, you know, God as the God of Israel and the, the God whom we serve. Um, and in a sense, you know, to get back to your point quickly, yeah, like it, in some sense, um, doesn't matter on that level if there are other gods or not, because that's not what the question is. The question is not the nature of God or the nature of the world. The question is the nature of my own self, my own uh, posture towards God. Um, and truth is not irrelevant, right? You couldn't say God doesn't exist, but God is my God. Um, but you have to have some sort of basic degree of belief in God, God's existence. But the question of like the, uh, what's the essence, what we're doing when we say Shema is not, can't be reduced to a truth statement. It's a statement of like who I am and who I want to be in the world. Any thoughts, questions so far?
Um, yeah. yeah, so what's your name again? Johnny Dunn. Uh, I don't know if we met. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, so with that last approach, how does the word echad fall into that? Um, so that, that's all. Um, to translate it like the Ibn Ezra, would be um, Shema Yisrael. Listen, you know, Israel, that first name. Hashem Elkeinu. Hashem is our God. Hashem echad. Hashem alone. That's how he understands it. There's a, God is the only one, God who is our God. Right? Um, that, in a sense, if uh, you often said, oh, Rambam thinks the Echad means, you know, n- not one in the category of gods, but one in sort of a unique philosophical sense, um, then for Ibn Ezra, uh, he's not getting into the question of, like, are there other gods? It doesn't matter to him. What matters is that when we say our God, that's, um, there's only one our God. Like, uh, that's how the connection between Echad and alone is the only our, or the only one that is ours. Yeah. Classic, like you ask the audience first, like, oh, what's the most important uh, verse and verse in the top, like in, in Jewish thought? Like, what's the, what, what, what do people know the best? And like, everyone answers Shema, then one really loud guy goes, like, Al Kain Beira. I'm not sure we have enough. It's so funny. Al Beira is a start of Okay, so um, hopefully people will have enough source sheets that people can at least see. Um, we've talked so far about how there's sort of two different possible ways of understanding Shema Yisrael Shema Kena Hashem Achad as a true statement of truth about God and reality, and then as a statement of our own sort of existential engagement, our dedication to God. It's, it's not, in a sense, a... Um, like, it's not a report, it's a declaration of, of faith. It's something that I'm choosing to do in this moment. I'm choosing to say and to make it true that God is my God, as so much as uh, rather than saying it's already true outside of myself, irrespective of anything having to do with me, uh, about whether or not um, God is my God. Uh, yeah, Source 6 is a, a non Jewish text. So it's very valuable for thinking about this. Um, this is uh, from a, a Christian theologian named John Caputo in a book on how to read. Uh, Kierkegaard, uh, but he talks about in his explanation of Kierkegaard um, what is what's the difference between objective <laughs> what is objective truth versus subjective truth, and uh, part of what gets into this is that in some sense there it's a, a misnomer. Like the idea of subjective truth is just means something entirely different than objective truth. Right? They, people use those words um, the same as if they were the same, but they're, you're talking about something else. One thing is. is subjectively true, as we're going to see, it means you are engaged with it in some way. It's not the same as, like, this is true about reality, this is a fact. Um, so as we could put it, is it an objective truth, the accent falls on the objective content of what you say, uh, the what. So that if you get the objective content right, such as 2 plus 3 equals 5, you are in the truth, no matter whether you are in your personal subjectivity a villain or an apostle. Right? It doesn't matter if you're good or bad, 2 plus 3 is always 5. Nothing prevents a famous mathematician from being an ethical scoundrel. The existential subject is accidental and remains a disinterested spectator. Uh, right? So when it comes to, to statements about like math or the world, the, who you are and how you relate to things is, doesn't matter. It's not a factor in what we typically call truth. Um, in subjective or existential truth, um, the accent falls on the how, on the way in which the subject lives, the real life and the existence of the subject. Here, where subjectivity is truth, uh, the subject is essential and passionately involved, uh, right? When we're saying Shema, according to the second understanding, it's not about, is this true outside of myself? What matters is, am I involved in this? In this case, even if what is said is objectively true, uh, that God is love, and this is, you see, sort of um, other context, if you are subjectively transformed by that, if you do not personally have love in your heart, then you do not have the truth, right? If God, if God being love in his context, or in our case, it's Shema, if God being our God does not deeply affect you, does not shape your life in some way, then um, in this subjective sense, it's not true, right? You could be saying it as something, as a fact about reality and have nothing to do with you, 
but that, like, that only works for the Rambam model in some sense. It doesn't work for the Rashbam Ibn Ezra model, for the Kabbalat al Muchut Shemayim model. Um, a pagan worshipping an idol, but with a heart full of love, comes out ahead of a learned Christian theologian who can eloquently expound on the nature of divine love, but is a scoundrel in his personal life, right? You, you can talk all you want about the metaphysics of God and God's oneness and God, everything being in God, but God being beyond everything. But if your life is not changed by that fact, then you have not really sort of accepted the yoke of heaven. The difference is between having an idea of the true God and having a true relationship to God. Here, the how of relationship is all, right? Relationships are fundamentally not facts. Relationships are things we actively construct through our engagement with them, right? You say someone is my friend, someone is my partner, someone is my spouse. You say that as if it was a fact. But the truth is that's a choice you make every day. Um, so like a, a favorite example of this is the idea of, uh, of a shirt. You talk about, like, it's, um, the one who's waiting for you, it's in English, the one, the idea that there's a person who's sort of metaphysically waiting for you is that there's a fact about reality that is true, that this person is meant for you. And like, it's much more correct to say that love and relationship and the one is much more, it's something you do and you choose. Right? The same thing is true for Kriya Shema. Kriya Shema is a choice we make when we say Shema. To say, I put myself into the context of Bnei Yisrael, I put myself in the context of God, that God is my God as God of Bnei Yisrael. Um, that it's, again, not irrelevant whether or not God exists and whether or not the Torah is true. And things. There, there have to be some thing, true fact there, but that's not what it's about. It's not like truth is not the point. The point is your own existential engagement with those truths and with those ideas. Um, I think Chris Ham's up first. Uh, does this fit neatly in a... Rationalist versus fideist uh, dialectic. Um, it doesn't have to. It could. Uh, meaning rationalists are more likely to think truth is important because they also think that like um, fideist, roughly that if I believe because I believe, the belief is something that wells up from within you, not something you irrationally arrive at. Um, there are a variety of ways of doing that, but um, the he says it could is it that distinction. The Rambam versus Sir Ezra is, is that necessarily rationalist? No, you could be a rationalist and think that. Um, like deep existential engagement is what matters. You should arrive at all those things rationally. Um, and I should note, I'm sort of selling Rambam short here because for Rambam, knowledge and love are never disconnected. There's a sense of deep emotional engagement um, that we think of as love. Rambam thinks is you arrive at through knowing and through, through truth. Um, so like Rambam himself wouldn't necessarily agree with the distinction I'm making, but I think the basic point is true, right? For him, Kriyat Shema is, I know this true thing about reality. Um, versus, hang on, uh, on, I don't know, for other thinkers, and I would throw my lot with them, true, I mean, Kriya Shema is about who am I, and what do I, not like in a, who am I, um, just in a, a purely fact, but who do I want to be, and who am I choosing to make myself? And, and just a second point, um, it's so interesting that they're trying to define space and logic to truth, when um, one of my teachers in his university, they, instead of having a swear jar, they had a subject and objective jar, and you were banned from using the term because it was, became a nothing term. Yeah, that was part of why I'm not a huge fan. Um, Caputo is, is writing a book about Kierkegaard, so he has to do that. <laughs> um, Lee. Um, yeah, so when you look at the, so the, the Gemara and Brachos that you guys, mm-hmm. um, it talks about, right, it's, it seems to be more of an Eden Ezra side that you could take into the yoke of heaven upon yourself, right, before observing the mitzvot. But isn't the, isn't this sort of personal connection you're creating with it, doesn't that only come from observing the mitzvah? So how, how can you expect there to be sort of a personal undertaking of, of the Yoke of Hashem, um, and sort of an emotional connection there before observing mitzvahs? Because I feel like uh, the, the, well, the personal connection comes out of, of observing, you know? Um, yeah, I think the, what's it called? Um, you can make the argument, and I think on a, also on a practical level, that very much is what happens sometimes. Uh, I think... Uh, this is actually maybe important to say, like, okay, but our relationship to God is not exhausted by the mitzvot, and those two can actually be discussed separately. And on that level, Chazal want us to actually say there is a sort of priority to God over the mitzvot. Right? The mitzvot themselves could become an idol in, in a radical situation. Uh, you say, like, I put mitzvot before God. Um, that can be interesting. Um, like, I think that would be where that, that distinction comes from, the importance of putting God before the, the mitzvot, is so that they don't become sort of idolatrous in themselves. But I'm saying um, that- how, how practically does Yeshua ben Korka think that one could accept upon themselves the yoke of heaven before accepting upon the mitzvot? I think it's that you're making that choice. You're making a choice of priority, right? I think on a practical level, you can't because you're Jewish, right? If you're saying Kriya Shema, you already have the mitzvot. 
But uh, like I right, you say, move Kriyat Shmakas Mitzvah, say Kriyat Shmakas Day. Um, but when you when you're doing that, you're making a statement of priority as well. Yeah. Yeah. To to expound on what he, uh, he said, uh, we just read the Ten Commandments, right? In this parsha, it never uses the word Lehamin Tamin that you should believe. It never says that anywhere in the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, it does say though that you should do this and don't do this. Don't mm-hmm. don't have idols in your home. Don't uh, say God's name in vain. Don't kill. Don't Still, so it's all actions. It's all actions. There's not even a single word about what you need to believe in. So maybe that's a, a supporting what he said, but it can only come from doing things. It can't, it can't come from just having an idea and believing in an idea. And that's what the Torah doesn't even say you should believe in something. Well, also, so, perhaps, so, yeah, I'm understanding that my Israel be parallel to that. But it doesn't say tell me. It never no, on, on some level, yes. This is that say. It's all they mean. Rambam himself. God and leaves off the like active relationship with God aspect of it. Um, I think I'm broadly in agreement with you. Um, it's worth noting that at the end of the uh, the splitting of the sea, after they've crossed through, it says The Jews will believe in God, whatever that means exactly. It makes it problematic. It does also question what is Munah mean, but but also I think like the whole story between the splitting of the sea. And Harsina makes it very clear that like emunah, whatever exactly it means in Zerah, isn't enough because they immediately fall into complaining and problems. Um, but what I actually want to look for here also is that there is a different word in, uh, unless my memory is terribly uh, betraying me, there's a different word in the Ten Commandments that actually might be, uh, be more important for this discussion. One second. But just because Which it is, asks um, you to do things, that doesn't mean that you do Okay. Um, in the midst of the, 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 the here's the things you do um, in the Ten Commandments, there is the, um, a, a brief aside about punishment. Um, it says, it's, you know, don't make any uh, idol or any likeness of anything that's on the uh, you know, heaven above, earth below, in the water. Don't bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those that hate me. But showing mercy to thousands of generations for those that love me and keep my commandments. So on some level, what I'm trying to trace the distinction is between like emunah in an a abstract sense and what it means to be uh, you know, those who love God and keep his commandments. So those are terms that are much more about like, who am I and what do I do. Um, that, um, again, I agree with you. Like, emunah is not the, the Torah's ideal. The Torah's ideal is to have some sort of ongoing relationship with God that um, deeply engages who you are. I also agree with you, I believe, that like, on a practical level, we can't ever get sort of before the mitzvot to ask what that is. We, we live a life of mitzvot. Um, it's like, if you're saying Kriyat Shema, as I said, you're, you're keeping the mitzvot already. Um, it's a question from within, um, from within that life of mitzvot. How do you think about God and, and, and mitzvot? Which is what I think is happening with that distinction in Kriyat Shema between Kabbalat Omo Hot Shemayim and Kabbalat Omo uh, Mitzvot that Rabbi Yeshua Ben Korcha wants us to be able to think separately about God and the mitzvot. Um, but even in both cases, like, I think like, the ba- more basic point I want to get at is that he wants us to be able to, um, or wants us to commit to God and be actively ch- dedicating ourselves to God much more than um, he's interested in us, like, knowing the truth about God. Um, there's a whole, plenty of sources here for anyone who wants to, to look more in the Rambam about um, you know, religion based on thinking of Judaism in terms of truth. Um, then starting from sources like 11 or whatever, there's a bunch in Rav Shagar and Rav Nachum Froman who are uh, recently passed away, unfortunately, uh, really designist thinkers. I uh, invite you all to go through them at your leisure. I'm happy to answer questions, but this is, uh, this is the end of our class. So thank you guys all for coming.